So vulnerable people are people who, uh, within a particular social group or within a particular community, are people who um, have special needs, if you like, or people who are in circumstances that put them in a particular and under particular circumstances that uh, constitute uh, some degree of risk to their well-being. So we think about vulnerable persons in a community as uh, children, for instance, are vulnerable because they don't have the full rights of a person in the society and they're dependent on other people taking care of them. Um, in many places, the elderly are also vulnerable because uh, they have more needs and they're uh, often unable to take care of their own needs and need support. In many places you find women, uh, especially pregnant women, are a vulnerable population because of their health status. Uh, but in societies that are misogynistic, uh, women, just by being women, can be considered a vulnerable population. There are other minorities that uh, would be considered vulnerable because of how a society deals with minorities. So we have people, you know, ethnic minorities, uh, a small group of people from one ethnic community living with a majority group can be considered vulnerable, especially if there's conflict. So people with mental illness, chronic mental illness, would be considered vulnerable in the society because they have special needs. Uh, people with developmental conditions would be considered vulnerable for the same reason. Uh, people with other chronic diseases that interfere with the ability to fully function or integrate in society would be considered vulnerable. So vulnerability is a function of having special needs or not being fully able to participate in the affairs of your community or your society and therefore putting you at some degree of risk uh, because of your, your vulnerability. So. Um, Traditionally, I mean, if you go back to where uh, human beings uh, started forming social groups, um, it was difficult uh, to engage in order to determine whether somebody is going to be a threat or whether somebody is going to be friendly. So we evolved in that environment to easily identify markers of safety or danger. Uh, and as we became more and more social and formed social groups that included some people but not others, uh, we developed identifiers for those social groups so that if you meet somebody from that social group, there's shorthand that says this person is safe, he's one of us, or that person is potentially dangerous uh, because he's not one of us. Uh, so, and before we learned how to communicate, how to be social with each other, how to interrogate a person's motives, um, violence was a tool that was used in order to assure your own safety. So either if you think that you're going to be overwhelmed or overpowered, you'd run away, escape, or if you think you're more powerful than the person you consider a danger, then you'd attack. That's how we evolved. Um, so a lot of humans still have those instincts in them, and therefore when they see a minority uh, whom they feel threatens their status quo or threatens uh, their state of being, their first reaction is a violent one, either verbal violence or physical violence or psychological violence against these people. And these vulnerable groups that I have listed uh, are not uniformly safe in our societies because there are people among our societies who look at those vulnerable groups as a threat to, to themselves and so they are more likely to attack them. Uh, so you'll find in this country we have instances of ethnic uh, violence against ethnic minorities in certain places for political reasons or for whatever reason people think. There's a lot of violence against women for instance and because uh, we expect them to behave in a certain way and if they don't behave like that we feel threatened or our masculinity feels threatened and we respond with violence. There's a lot of violence against children, again because we have set rules and we want them to do things in a certain way and if they don't conform to what we have uh, decided that they should do, then our first instinct is to become violent. So it is often easy for the average person to consider violence against a vulnerable person partly because that person is vulnerable and is probably not able to fight back. Um, and many people think it's the easy way of getting people to do what you want them to do uh, by threatening violence or actually visiting violence upon them.
Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, there are many types of violence that are perpetrated against people who are vulnerable. And we have many, many examples of those even in this country. Um, there is actual physical violence and we see many, many instances of that. Um, I think in the media recently, if, if you watch how our politicians communicate, if you watch how public figures communicate, they use very violent language. Uh, when politicians are campaigning, they liken it to going to war. Uh, we are going to finish you, we are going to pulverize you, we are going to destroy you. Our language is very violent. <clears throat> and this normalizes physical violence against people who are different from us. Uh, so the outcome of anger, the outcome of their frustration, uh, becomes violence, uh, physical violence. There are other forms of violence that are used by people against vulnerable groups, including sexual violence, especially against women or sexual minorities. So people have used rape and sexual abuse as, as a weapon against people that they find threatening to them, uh, and yet these people occupy a vulnerable position. Uh, there is, you know, emotional violence. Uh, where you are put in a situation where you feel a certain uncomfortable way uh, by virtue of being different or being a minority um, in a particular setting. There's verbal violence uh, where uh, people throw hurtful words at you or people are unnecessarily harsh or people are insulting against you. So all those are forms of violence. Uh, violence that affects you physically, violence that affects you psychologically, violence that affects you socially. For instance, people ostracizing you or keeping you apart uh, because of who you are. So all those are forms of violence. So children are especially vulnerable because they find themselves in a war situation for which they are not responsible and from which they cannot escape without additional assistance. So many times they find themselves helpless, um, they find themselves caught between conflicting parties uh, which they do not understand and uh, it creates an environment of instability. One of the greatest needs for children who are growing up is a sense of safety and security in the environment, a sense of predictability, knowing that uh, you know this environment will remain like this tomorrow, the day after, next year, so that they don't have to worry about that. Um, but a war environment destroys all that. A war environment creates uncertainty that people you see today might not be there tomorrow because of the consequences of war. Um, there's often displacement that's associated with war and uh, this creates instability, uh, it creates problems with uh, you know, children's schooling, development, peer relations and so on. All those are disrupted in a situation of war. And as a result of that then, they there's a huge risk of children developing trauma-related conditions. Um, the one that is most commonly cited is post-traumatic stress disorder, which happens after exposure, either witnessing trauma or experiencing this trauma themselves. But then there are many other conditions also that can arise as a result of exposure to violence, especially prolonged violence, including a variety of anxiety disorders, uh, mood disorders like depression, um, and other trauma-related disorders as well. Uh, children who have been exposed to a war zone, uh, you know, they might have two different outcomes, if you like. Uh, there's a group that will then develop with these residual psychological uh, impacts, and this affects them for the rest of their life unless there's an intervention. But then there are those who might, uh, despite that hardship, still come out uh, stronger, resilient, and better able to deal with the challenges of day-to-day -day life. So it doesn't mean that exposure to this war situation uniformly leads to psychological problems. It can help some people to develop a stronger personality and a stronger coping ability to deal with challenges in life. But there's a significant proportion of children who will be affected psychologically and develop uh, mental problems. Um, it also affects their ability to interact with other people. So they will have social problems uh, even if they are removed from the war situation. Uh, the body and mind remains in war footing and so they would have difficulty integrating, difficulty handling strangers, difficulty uh, feeling safe and secure even if the war situation has passed. And now we have evidence that the impacts of trauma, including war-related trauma,
can be transmitted from one generation to another. Even if people move on to a safer environment, um, there are certain elements that are transmitted to their children. Uh, some of it is socially transmitted in the sense that the way the parents behave uh, instructs how the children are going to behave. But some of it we think is uh, biological. In other words, uh, your genetic code uh, and how it expresses itself is altered in some way and this is transmissible to the next generation. I think the biggest uh, challenge for most uh, people and in most societies is to first of all step back and think about what is important to them. Uh, if we as Kenyans have established uh, the right of a person to be as one of our core values, as one of the things that we hold dear, then our common humanity is what should bind us. Uh, the fact that we are different is a good thing because it, it adds spice, it's the diversity that adds spice to, to our social interaction. If everybody was the same, then I wouldn't need to travel far from my village. Um, and so difference is a good thing. Uh, the sexual minorities, the people, the gay, uh, lesbians, transgender, uh, bisexual, they are heavily stigmatized in this part of the world. And they're stigmatized uh, partly because uh, the vast majority of people are not socialized to understand that there's difference in how we express our sexuality. Uh, and in addition, a lot of uh, the religious groups uh, say very violent things against people who are not heterosexual. Uh, secondly then, uh, politicians take advantage of this because they think saying these things will appeal to the majority and they, they, they want to appeal to the majority and get votes, so they also come and amplify these things. Um, and the net effect of this is that you create a situation where a person who is gay doesn't feel safe even though uh, they are productive citizens, even though everything else about their life is just like anybody else. So they don't feel safe. And the threats of violence especially are really difficult to deal with for a person who might be gay, because then they don't know how to interact with strangers. You create uncertainty in relationships. You create a situation where they're not free to express themselves. They're not free to interact with everybody unless they are assured of safety because of their sexuality, something that should never arise because when we are recruiting people, we don't ask them about their sexuality. When, when children are going to school, nobody asks them when they grow up, who are they going to be sexually attracted to? And so it is strange that then we become so fixated again about people who uh, have a different sexuality from ourselves. Um, so I think it's part of that expression, uh, our inability to engage in uh, what I would call civilized conversation in order to understand where everybody is coming from that then makes violence uh, against uh, people who are not heterosexual to become uh, one of the options that we think we have when we are engaging with them. Illnesses in this part of the world are stigmatized uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, we, have, we have difficulties conversing about sex uh, in this part of the world. We have difficulties imagining uh, that people can be different uh, with relation to sex. So we stigmatize certain sexual practices. We stigmatize certain conversations around sex. And when HIV came along, it was associated with sex. And so, and in fact, one could say uh, society started associating it with bad sex or having sex with bad people. And so the stigma was transferred to the illness as well and to the people who have the illness. So as a result, we treat, it's improving, I think, over time because people are now freely speaking about HIV. But there's still a significant portion of our population that treats people with HIV as if they are sinners, as if they have uh, you know, done something so evil um, that then places them in a category uh, of vulnerable people. And again, because of our difficulties in engaging in civilized conversation, we transfer those attitudes into our behavior and there's an increased likelihood of violence, even uh, in healthcare settings. Uh, because healthcare workers carry their attitudes from the society where they come from. And unless somebody is intentional and somebody thinks about it, they will act out the same way their kinsmen in the village uh, act out. I think it's important for healthcare settings to have codes of conduct that uh, stipulate what, how every human being who walks into that structure should be treated.
uh, how everybody should be treated with respect and dignity, and how everybody should be dealt with according to their need, not according to their identity or according to where they come from or what, how much money they have. So these codes of conduct need to be present in every healthcare setting in order to protect the patients, but also to protect the health workers in that environment from either aggressive patients or from colleagues who think that violence is, 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 an, uh, is an option. So I think that, that is very important. And for those of us in mental health, it's important for us to continuously advocate on behalf of the vulnerable people because of the risk to mental health that these vulnerabilities bring. And how society handles vulnerable people uh, increases the risk uh, of mental ill health. And so we should be at the forefront, in fact, uh, advocating for humane treatment of everyone, for dignified treatment of everyone. And, and, and I think we have a huge potential to make our society safer, to make our societies uh, better places for people to grow up and people to live. So widespread violence is indeed more common in sections of our population that are poor or uh, of low socioeconomic status. And uh, one can think about this in the context of um, competition for scarce resources. Um, sometimes people compete for things as basic as food, people compete for things as basic as, as water, people compete for things as basic as livestock and so on and so forth. And these are avenues for violence. Um, addressing socioeconomic disparities, uh, addressing uh, the divisions in society along socioeconomic lines is one of the known recognized methods of reducing the risk of violence in societies. So it's, it's really about competition for resources, but then it ties in to again how we handle frustration, how we handle disappointment, how we handle failure. And if the primary method of dealing with these things is by violence, um, then people are likely to, 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 to become violent when they're engaging in that kind of competition. You will find that uh, in segments of our society where people have a little bit more by way of resources, uh, there's less likelihood of mass violence because that competition for resources doesn't really exist and people have the ability then to explore other ways of interacting with people. Uh, without resorting to violence. So indeed, if I were asked what are the four things that uh, need to be addressed in order to reduce the risk of violence at a communal setting, uh, poverty would be one of the things, poverty and disparities would be one of the top things that I would ask anybody to begin addressing. The other things that are a little bit more difficult, for instance, men are more likely to be violent, so we have to do advocacy to reduce violence, uh, empower men by giving them other methods of dealing with frustration and disappointment, and so on and so forth. Um, so those are just some of the things that uh, I, would, uh, I would suggest uh, that we deal with in order to reduce the risk of violence in our communities. I think uh, we, we need to leave to our national aspiration of being a place where people have the opportunity to prosper and for people to find happiness for themselves and for their families. Um, and in order to do that then, you have to be very deliberate about how you design your society. You can't have a society where you have huge disparities in income, huge disparities in socioeconomic status. You can't have a society where um, diversity is viewed as a threat rather than as a strength. You can't have a society where, um, you know, poor people are treated poorly by virtue of not having resources so that a person who doesn't have uh, money and uh, they get mentally ill, they can't access services. So governments that are intent on having productive, healthy populations have to prioritize a number of things. Uh, one of those things is the health status of the people. So they have to provide access to health care for everyone at a basic minimum so that nobody uh, gets into, you know, moves from one socioeconomic status to a lower one by virtue of getting an illness in the family. That needs to be taken care of. Another thing that we, have, we can do in order to improve our societies and reduce the risks that I've talked about is education. So governments are elected to ensure that people have access to education. 
uh, other than health. And the other thing is to ensure a safe and secure environment where children and adults can thrive and uh, you know, pursue the things that they find to be important for themselves. And the final thing I think is the infrastructure, so that somebody uh, doesn't have to travel by Mkokoteni to, you know, through very rough terrain in order to get access to these services that I have spoken about. So I think uh, trying to reduce these disparities, uh, eliminating a population, a, a, a segments of the population that are in uh, extreme poverty, Re eliminating extreme poverty would be one way of uh, starting to improve the mental health status of our people. And I think uh, this should be the reasons why we elect governments. This should be the reasons why we have local governments and the national government. This should be the reason why public servants wake up every day and go to work to address these challenges. That if addressed, then uh, you would result in a society that is more healthy uh, and therefore more productive. I can tell you that a society that has people who are not mentally healthy uh, cannot meet its full potential, it cannot be productive. Um, and so it's in the best interest of anybody who is managing people to make sure that you know, their mental health is in a good place. And they can do that by addressing the four issues I have uh, pointed out and ensuring that every policy initiative, every legislation that is passed, somebody sits down and thinks about what are the mental health consequences of this policy, what are the mental health consequences of this act that we are passing in Parliament. And if everybody is deliberate uh, about that, you will have less instances of violence, you will have more thoughtfully designed public spaces, uh, you will have more thoughtfully designed public services, including the education system, the health system, and so on and so forth. So post-traumatic stress disorder is a condition that arises after somebody has been exposed to a traumatic event or a potentially traumatic event. And there's a whole list, a whole variety of traumatic events, including uh, things that threaten an individual's life or things that cause actual harm or things that somebody witnesses that are also uh, potentially traumatic. So as a result of that, <clears throat> a small but significant proportion of people will develop post-traumatic stress disorder among other conditions. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is, is a mental illness, it's classified as a, a trauma-related uh, mental disorder and uh, there are a variety of treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder that uh, include medications because some of the symptoms require medication, uh, includes psychological interventions which we call psychotherapy and include social adjustments in the life of this individual. Uh, a proportion of people who have PTSD and who get this evidence-based care will improve and will be able to resume their lives as near normal as is possible after exposure to those traumas. But there will be a proportion, a small proportion, who will continue to have some symptoms despite receiving the best treatment available. Um, and those then we have to figure out ways of helping them to cope with some of those symptoms that are very difficult to, 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 to go away. So if somebody has PTSD, there is help, it's available. Um, they can get treatments, a variety of treatments. Uh, some of those treatments might work for one person and not for another, so we keep trying different modalities of treatment. Um, and ultimately, no matter the severity of the illness, no matter the symptoms that somebody has, uh, you should always have hope that uh, there will be something that can be done to either take the symptoms away or help you cope if they are difficult to, to, to eliminate. The primary responsibility of uh, protecting uh, people from violence lies with the governments that we elect. Because uh, the government is defined as an organization that has a monopoly or should have the monopoly of violence. Uh, and that should deploy that violence for the benefit of the citizens. So the primary responsibility lies with government to create environments that are free from violence. Now having said that then, uh, I would start at the lowest level, the lowest unit of our society, in the family. Uh, it is a primary responsibility for primary caregivers, for families, for parents, for mothers and fathers, to raise children in an environment that is free of violence. Uh, we have normalized in this country uh, the saying that you spare the road and spoil the child. Uh, I want to state emphatically that in fact, uh, regularly beating up growing children messes up their minds, messes up their brains, and 
prevents them from achieving their full potential, no matter how they turn out. So raising children in an environment free of violence is one way of reducing the risk of violence in future because people who live in an environment that is violent are more likely to perpetrate violence when they are able to do so. Uh, so family responsibilities. Then institutions that people go through, schools, should be environments that are free of violence and that should be a policy that is enforced uh, across all academic and administrative uh, educational institutions. Uh, because again, that is where people go and they learn habits. They learn how to be citizens of a country. And if those places are full of violence, uh, you expect that country to be a violent place. Other institutions, including health institutions, places where people congregate, religious institutions, should also be environments that are free of violence and that discourage violence against other people. So we all have a responsibility, um, especially when you see violence being meted out against people, we have a responsibility to speak out. We have a responsibility to point out that the violence is not solving any problem, it's in fact creating more problems for the future. Once you start, it's a cascade that uh, might even come back and harm you, the person who starts this process. So we all have a responsibility to speak out against violence in our communities, all the forms of violence that we have listed, and to encourage people to find alternative ways of solving disputes, alternative ways of dealing with their frustrations, alternative ways of dealing with their failures, rather than resorting to violence against other people. Yeah, yeah, so my name is Professor Lukoya Tuoli, and my message is, hurt people, hurt people.